chance to be here. I did miss my first opportunity to talk due to Sandy. Uh, very bad timing. I, we landed about, or would have landed about 20 minutes after the storm hit New York. So uh, it's very nice to be back and see lots of friends and familiar faces in the audience. What I'm going to do tonight is um, talk about the velodrome, but very quickly, because I have an enormous number of slides, rattle through a quick presentation about our office and how, um, how we think about work. Well, we don't tend to verbalise it, we don't tend to talk about it, we just do architecture. So I guess we look back and try and work out what we were thinking afterwards. Um, the first slide is, by way of introduction, Michael Hopkins um, worked as a partner with Norman Foster and they did this building together, the Willis Faber building in Ipswich, which at the time was probably the first um, flush glazed building uh, and very radical, 1975 it says on the bottom of the screen. Um, after that, he built a house for himself again in 1975, similar to the Eames house, and there might be some discussion afterwards about um, Europe, England, and America, and how we do things differently in terms of building. <coughs> Whereas Eames had sought out a series of components, Michael tried to make his house out of as fewer pieces as possible. Um, I was also interested in Jean Prouvé and sort of um, systems of, of panelized construction, and went on to set up a company that made um, unitized buildings, this is called the Katira system, and they made a small number of those, the company went out of business, but we reclaimed one and had it, and still use it today as our office in Maribyrn in, in London, it makes a very fine space to work in, not very well insulated, but that was 1975. Um, and then continuing that tradition of steel and glass, Michael got into, with his partners at the time, working in fabric and more experimental architecture from the late 70s and did a number of buildings like the Schlumberger Research Centre in Cambridge. Um, always with some eye on context, this was trying to make an interesting landscape in the flat fens of Cambridgeshire. But at the same time, and perhaps what made him a bit different from Norman and Richard Rogers and that cohort at the time, was that he was fascinated by old construction and bought this small house off the church commissioners in Suffolk and then set about restoring it. And in that process sort of painstakingly drew every detail of the house and you'll see elements of um, the Fonsworth house in the plan even though it was an old uh, originally medieval house and at the time um, Eric de Mare was a photographer taking pictures um, that went into J.M. Richards book called The Functional Tradition and this was the sort of early industrial architecture we saw in Britain and we don't really look at these books in the office, but somehow that's the spirit of those buildings is, is with us, I think, in the way we do things. There's a certain uh, anonymity about it, uh, and a charm, and perhaps a Europeanness that we quite like. They're not all brick buildings, but they just took on these forms in quite a playful way, at the same time as being very functional, quite rational. And that led on to the, the first uh, use of masonry in the office. It was a competition for Lords, which is the home of cricket in London, and Verity and Architects had built this stand and the competition was to, to build a new stand. All the other competitors knocked it down and started again. But Michael looked at those uh, seven brick arches and felt we could do something with that. So learned how to redo um, lime mortar traditional construction without expansion joints and built a further 20 arches and completed it. And then on top put quite a contrasting high-tech extension. So. Above that brick arch sits a finely balanced structure designed by Peter Rice with this fabric on top. And so this whole notion of sort of light, light structure and heavy structure and the marriage of the two gave rise to something that was sort of far richer and far more interesting than just working in concrete, steel and glass. And that then led on to other work and commissions like Glanborn Opera House made out of handmade brick and looking back with um, to Louis Kahn really and his extra library and how he put brick piers together and express structure. This is a building for the summer, has no insulation in it. Everything methodically worked out, all details are visible. And it's a sort of modern movement architecture, everything ordered and on a structural grid just happens to be built out of traditional handmade materials. The inside is lined out in pitch pine, very soft, warm finish. And that, um, that sort of familiarity with working with masonry meant we could work in quite difficult, challenging contexts. This is Norwich Cathedral where we did a project in the hostry and the refectory. 
It was ransacked um, in the dissolution of the monasteries and had lain completely away. This is the refectory, a wall remained, the cloisters beyond that. And the project really was to embrace that and to build on the old walls and extend up in a contemporary fashion, but using traditional materials. So we devised a structure that sat with inboard of the medieval walls. On the left, you'll see where they're built up in a contemporary fashion. And so this structure sort of leans gently against the old construction, but it takes its own load down in the center. And then we used English oak, um, glass, obviously, little bits of stainless steel and cast lead on the roof. And the refectory was a space on the top with all the kitchens and services in this wooden box underneath. And so you can see there the joint between the new and the old in that wall. Something quite rich working in these historic contexts. One of the key themes in all of our work which you can see through to Michael's house, is this notion of a, a whole plane of, of glass, so you can expose the section of the building. It's a sort of classic modern movement idea that the, the workings of the building can be, can be exposed, and that when you've designed the section, you've kind of got the building sorted, and you can chop it up at the ends and expose that. Um, and then, just to show we're not stuck in the past, we've done some uh, very of an individual competitions like this one for a, a building for the British Antarctic Survey. In 1956, a group of researchers went from Cambridge and discovered the hole in the ozone layer by measuring climate data from a particular point on the Brunt Ice Shelf. Very important to keep the measurements in the same location so they're back there every year, despite the fact the ice shelf is carving off and going into the sea. And we worked with Chris Wise and Expedition and came up with a building that was made from shipping containers bolted together two stories high, but concealed inside it were a set of hydraulic legs that allowed it to walk, so it could walk and stay still, stay in the same place. And they built this fantastic Lego model that actually walked with hydraulics. Uh, we didn't win the competition because the capital cost was more than the government wanted to pay, so instead they commissioned one, they now go down and dismantle and move every five years. Um, so that's just a kind of rapid um, whiz through our kind of culture of architecture background, really. And I'll talk a little bit now about a couple of projects we've done here in the States, starting with Croon Hall at Yale. We started this project in 2005, and the brief, the program was to build a small academic building and to try and unify this space on the southwest quadrant of Science Hill, and at the same time make an international center for discussing the environment and provoke Yale and other universities into being more green in the way they looked at their architecture. So, this really demonstrates how our generation of architects don't get the best sites anymore. And we had to make deal with that. And the notion was a very, very simple building that didn't touch the other buildings because it was just too difficult in terms of levels and, and detail. And formed two courtyards either side at different levels, underneath one of which we put all the services and bury those and create a new courtyard. So as much as it's a building, it's also two new courtyards for Yale. There you see the section. And we look very hard at getting sunlight in, so the roof allows sunlight into the north courtyard, and by raising the south courtyard, we've allowed more sunlight in to, behind these rather dark neo-Gothic buildings. So we built this very early model, the sort of toast rack idea that this long, thin building, we could take all the program out of it and have three stories of very regular academic offices for, for the staff, and then put all the interesting functions in a piano noble on the top floor. And at the time we were um, sort of querying whether we built it in the, the red stone of the surrounding buildings, but we used the Briar Hill stone from the rest of the campus just because it was more cheery and a bit brighter. But clearly it's a building that sits in that Yale tradition in terms of its expression of facades. We played the same trick on the ends of glazing those and, and shading them. But when we were at the interview, Michael and I were looking through Louis Kahn's drawings in the plans room, and we saw that Yale had all these forests in upstate New York, uh, and so we hit on this idea. If we started felling some lumber at that time, we could season it, and by the time we'd built the carcass of the building, it could be fitted out. So the inside of the building is actually fitted out with their own, own wood, which is a nice story. You, we couldn't do that on the structural timbers. These were Douglas fir, blue lamp beams, traditional kind of thing. And echoing somewhat a Connecticut barn, these shapes sit on top of the masonry construction. 
And then the very linear plan has these cellular rooms up and down, and we're trying to get daylight into the middle of the building to help save energy and make it a nice journey up to the top. So this linear staircase links all the floors. And on the right-hand side, you see the building has two ends glazed, and you can walk through the building as part of the campus. And on the top floor is this environment centre and lecture theatre, which I think is proving quite successful because it's a nice place to be. In terms of the building's performance, um, the challenge really was to take what we'd learned of, from doing 20 years of working with Arup in particular on very integrated architecture and engineering buildings that performed at a very high level and see if we could move those from the temperate climate of the UK to Connecticut, which is a much harsher climate. And we found the way to do that was to have systems that um, were either mechanically operated in summer and winter, winter because it was so cold, we needed windows closed, summer because it was so humid, we couldn't use natural ventilation. And then in spring and fall, have a natural ventilation system. So with the participation of the occupants, we had a, a sort of traffic light system that would advise them if it was a windows open day or a windows closed day. Um, and after that, we had a whole series of measures that would reduce energy consumption in the building. And I mean, that's the secret really in terms of high performing buildings. There's no easy answer to reducing energy consumption. You need to work on a large number of measures to just chip away and make a difference. Um, this building is a demonstration building, so it was off the university the grid. In the end, we, compared to an ASHRAE 90.12004 academic building, reduced um, energy and carbon by about 60%, 25% of which was provided by the photovoltaics on the roof. So it performed pretty well. Um, after that, we asked to look at a building at Princeton, the Frick Chemistry Laboratory, um, an enormous science building, ironically located in a wood this time. And the theme of this building was really about making this enormous sort of cathedral to science, if you like, and trying to prevent what we call hibernation amongst the scientists, where they didn't necessarily talk to each other because they were so engrossed in their research. And ironically, the building had come about, or the funding for the building had come about through a serendipitous conversation between groups of scientists who discovered um, a drug which was then used in a, a, a lung cancer cure. So the patent for that had raised the funds for the building. And we took the kind of standard lab diagram on the left there, which separates office space from lab space, and tried to mix it up, because the building was going to be on four or five floors, and we didn't want the floors to be disconnected. And we wanted everybody to be able to be in conversation with each other. So we developed a very rational, flexible, modular plan with the labs at the top and the offices at the bottom, pull them apart and let daylight in between. Um, and so a typical lab space, which would look like this and be like any other lab, very modular, but importantly, glazed at either end. And then the office space on the other blocks, facing out, looking over the woods, would look like this. And the space in between, we really wanted to be more like a workshop and not feel too corporate. And so we, we worked very hard to glaze everything, rotate the cores, and make the transparency across the building, which is the opposite of how science buildings normally work. And so sort of work the program up into this diagram, here represented in a massive block of perspex. And this is the final atrium with the artwork by Kendall Buster inside. And at the, at the bottom of cafes and reading spaces, the graduate rooms were on the lower level and three floors of research were above that for offices on the right. And then, contrary to the convention here, we hid the elevators so people couldn't use them and put the stairs very much on display so people were seen going up and down the stairs and got this cross transparency going right across the building. So if you're in the office, you can look right through the labs and out to the other side. And then put the graduates and their research spaces on display on the lower floor. So the end of the building sort of expressed that simple diagram. We used granite, and then we found a means of using sandcast aluminium to make these shades over the glazing. And we had a photovoltaic array over the atrium, which helped shade and <coughs> bring some light down into that space. So highly rational, sort of modular steel building. So hopefully that served as an introduction to how we think about buildings. Um, London won the Olympics, and we were euphoric because we'd beaten Paris, but I'm now reminded we must have beaten New York at the same time, so <laughs> it's probably, probably in both our interests you didn't get it, but um, London very much enjoyed putting the games on, and it, it has been a sort of fantastic summer of sport for Britain. 
Um, not only did we do well, but people actually started smiling and enjoying themselves briefly. Um, so what I'm going to do now is take you through how we, how we thought about this building and then how we put it together. It, um, it's kind of a terrifying ordeal in a way because the British track cycling team are by far the most successful um, Olympic sport we have. And in Beijing, now it's been cropped off the bottom, but Britain won 47 medals, 14 of which were in cycling, and we won 19 gold medals in Beijing, eight of which were in cycling. So the idea of designing the velodrome for the British track cycling team's home was an enormous challenge. And somebody pointed out that Britain's only good at sports that we, we sit down in, so we do very well at <laughs> <laughs> Equestrian, sailing, and track cycling. I have to say, it is. In its uh, defence, track cycling is quite energetic compared to the other two, but um, it's actually true. Um, we had Chris Hoy, who's a preeminent Scottish cyclist on the jury, and he was very helpful in us um, in thinking about this building. And the brief really was to design the fastest possible velodrome, because what you understand when you get into the culture of the Olympics is it's not just the athletes competing with each other, but the venues are competing with each other, because the countries are competing with each other to have the best games. And so you want world records, you want the athletes to do very well. So we identified everything that could affect speed on the bike. So we had the five criteria. Um, the athletes, we couldn't do much about them. Um, obviously they have to be fit and they have their odd moments of transgression. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that's really not for us. So, so uh, the equipment, um, the equipment is actually fixed. The UCI, who rule the sport, have deemed the way to track bikes. Uh, the rules are very specific. Britain has done so well, they keep changing the rules because the, the, the UCI is mainly run by French people with an Irish president. <laughs> and they're not keen on Britain doing so well, so they change the rules to um, protest against the British. Anyway, <coughs> it's beyond our control. The next three are within our control to some extent. So the track. Um, I don't know how much you know about cycle tracks, but they're not fixed. It's not like a running track, they're not a given. And there's two uh, preeminent track designers in the world. I'll just say this screen is um, stretching everything, so that's not accurate. But um, there's a German guy called Ralph Schumann, who's uh, a third generation track designer and builder, who's done the most in the world. And then there's an Australian guy who lives in London called Ron Webb. Sherman's tracks are the blue ones, and you can see there they're slightly, they're both 250 metres. His tracks are slightly narrower, but longer, which are favoured by the sprinters, because when they come out of that last bend, going round anti-clockwise, they have slightly longer to get to the finish line, so they can overtake their rival. The round ones by Ron Webb are slightly rounder and more circular, so for all the other forms of racing, they're actually quicker, because the circles is a quicker, quicker circuit to get round. So the British cycle, team opted to go with a Ron Webb track. Their one in Manchester was designed by him. So they asked him to come up with a track that was slightly faster than any he'd done before. And he likened it to being a, a yacht designer. Every time you do a new boat, you want to just slightly change the keel and adjust the 3D geometry, which he did. And he wouldn't tell anyone what he'd changed, but all give us the drawings. He'd only give us a few setting out points. So the way it's built, it's, um, it's seven meters long. It's 42 degrees on the banking and 12 degrees on the straight. And um, those straight lines just change angle between the 12 degrees and 42 degrees, which you see going in there. And it sits over a big void with some pretty heavyweight trusses underneath, 850 trusses. <coughs> those go in. And then on top of that, a team of carpenters install timber um, battens, square timbers of Siberian pine. That grows straight and very true. And they're about five or six meters in length. And they get twisted round and hammered in with 350,000 nails by hand. And they build that up. And there's 56 kilometers of timber to make up the track. So they just work their way up, nailing those in. There's no special jointing between them. They're just butt jointed together. So it's very important that humidity in the building is controlled. If they expand too much, and um, they you know, start to push each other off. And so you end up with this amazingly smooth track, absolutely terrifying to ride around because it, it looks and feels like it's about 60 degrees, not 42 degrees. And then underneath, this amazing space, which when they're riding around is the most incredible uh, noise echo chamber underneath. So, we got the track, 
Um, what's the next thing that could influence how fast we could make the London track? Well, we did some research on all the previous tracks and world records, and we charted those. Uh, this is done by some of the marks with dyslexia. We actually made it go up, but the time should be coming down. Um, <laughs> and we, look, we looked at all the different um, factors that could influence. And obviously, the um, altitude, the air thickness, density was important. And a lot of world records were broken in La Paz, where the air is very thin. But the other big factor was temperature. The warmer the air gets, the thinner it gets. And the cyclists go faster. And it actually makes quite a considerable difference. So when they're training, they'll sit there with laptops, put in the temperature, and compensate for competition traditions. So what generally happens is in these indoor velodromes, which are now ubiquitous for major events like the Olympics, um, you will warm the track up for a couple of weeks beforehand and get it at 28 degrees centigrade. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Uncomfortably hot, anyway. Um, and so you could just go that bit faster. Um, and that was going to be essential if we wanted world records on the track. So we put us a series of underfloor heating uh, elements underneath the centre of the track. Clearly, with the timber track, you couldn't have any heat near the track itself. On the concourse, we had uh, underfloor heating. And then after that, we put in a series of heaters underneath the seats, which could just zap some heat into the arena very quickly. But that does present a problem, because the, the crowd don't want to be hot. The athletes don't mind being hot. They're going around at 50 miles an hour. They're not going to feel the heat. The ones warming up in the middle do get warm, but um, they will cool off before they start their race. So the heating system can work uh, just to blow warm air in to supplement and give a quick boost if that's needed. And the way that worked was we just had nozzles fixed under the seats there, and we had an air intake on the outside, which became part of the aesthetic of the outside of the building. And this, this kind of documents the dilemma, really, of the, of the track. You know, it can't be too hot for the athletes. They want it absolutely boiling. The spectators, meanwhile, you've got to keep it comfortable. There are certain velodromes in the world where they just heat it up and then sell more beer, which seems to suit the owners, but not necessarily a good idea in the Olympics or Britain. Um, so we managed to bring a little bit of natural air in uh, without cooling that we could uh, use to keep the spectators cool. And then using buoyancy, we could take the hot air out naturally by convection at high levels. And we were working with Klaus Bode at BDSP. We did a lot of um, CFD analysis to prove all of that was going to work. And then the building envelope itself was very highly insulated. And that, I'll come on to later, was about making it cheap to run in legacy. And then in, in winter, if needs be, you can just slightly warm the air coming in uh, to keep the crowd warm if, if needed. So. We've, we've got, hopefully, the fastest track in the world in terms of geometry and construction. We've got a venue which has got uh, lots of heat in it, and so very fast. Um, we managed to fill the building and finish it in February 2011. So we were, um, through the good organization of the British Olympic Delivery Authority, well ahead of schedule, which is good. Not quite sure how Rio is getting on. Um, but. The thing that we didn't have in there really was the atmosphere of the crowd and how important that was. And um, we had um, Chris Hoy on the jury, and he was saying that what tends to happen is the crowd wrap around the track, but on one side of the track they'll have the judges and the Olympic family and everyone. And you'll cycle around, you get a massive cheer on one side and an absolute total silence on the other side, and that's not good for keeping them going. So could we find a way to wrap the crowd all the way around and, and get the noise levels up? Because it really did make a difference. And if he's telling you that, it must be true. So. These were the very first sketches we did, um, the focus being on, on absolutely on the track and movement of the athletes. Um, and so we, we took the 6,000 seats, which was a given, and we split it in half. We wrapped 3,000 round the track and just had three or four rows at the end where it's 42 degrees because it's not great visibility, but very important for continuity. And then more, up to about 12 rows on the straights. We then, bottom left, put a concourse in where you could walk around and, and get to your seats and importantly look out. And we put the other 3,000 seats up in the air over the straights where they get the very good views. And as you'll see, that has an effect of sort of rotating through 90 degrees the orientation of the building. And then we worked very, very hard on that, on that seating bowl in terms of its geometry 
and we were very keen to keep the crowd as close as humanly possible to the track. So we did it based on sight lines and put every single person as close to the, the track as possible. It's an incredibly exciting sport to watch because there's no real boundary. There's about four inches of wood between the front spectator and the riders. So you really are up close. And in February, they had a, as 2012, they had a test event, um, which was fantastically successful. Um, and the, the track was tested for the first time and several world records were broken at a test event, which was good, the World Cup. Now this, let's see if this, maybe works. this was Chris Hoy riding in the Kirin, which is a kind of odd Japanese race, which uh, attracts an enormous amount of betting in Japan. And they do six laps, they ride behind the motorbike, but the motorbike peels off after four laps, and six or seven riders then battle it out. Phenomenally dangerous, because we're going so fast. In fact, you'll see a crash on, the, on this one. Pretty amazing. So it's being laps in under 10 seconds. And so um, this is, I took this from one of the back seats and this, this sort of notion of bringing the seats as close to the arena as possible and that, that sort of gladiatorial sense of excitement as they're belting around is, is, is fantastic. And if you can get into a Belgium and watch a race, it is just absolutely brilliant. Um, but in terms of building an Olympic building, you're not only sort of got this pressure you must do to get the field of play right, get the track right and have something fantastic for athletes but you've, you've got the whole that you know five billion people around the world allegedly watching it on television so what do you do you know we've had Beijing before everyone was saying oh London's going to be terrible after Beijing those Olympics are amazing and this building which is probably the best television building in the world looked absolutely incredible but how do we position ourselves in relation to that and what was our philosophy that could make us um, be equally proud, if you like, of what we were going to do. And I like this photograph on the bottom left because it actually shows there's a totally rational structure hiding inside that bird's nest when you see those repeat elements. And we looked at the steel weights on those buildings. That's 650 kilograms a meter squared. The velodrome is 85. Could we do something which was much lighter? And so we looked at Chris Hoy's thighs and the lighter on them and thought, well, <laughs> <laughs> can we stretch? Can we stretch an envelope around our building in the same way like was stretched around his thigh? <laughs> <laughs> he has to buy trousers two sizes too big and then take the waist in, but that's a whole other story. Um, so having got that section at the top with the seat split and we shrunk the envelope around it, it's very stretched this. And we worked very hard with Chris Wise and his team and we were looking at this double curving roof structure. Um, and we brought the ends down incredibly tightly on the longitudinal section there. And that meant, like the picture you saw before, when you're sitting in the seats at the back, you can't actually see across to the top seats on the other side. But who needs to? You're watching the track cycle, and that actually increases your focus on the track, increases, your, increases the acoustics and the atmosphere inside, but also vastly reduces the amount of space in the building, therefore the amount of air you have to heat, and the cost in carbon that's in the envelope of it as well. So that gave us this double curvature, and we split the structure into 48 trusses and then put a... a um, sort of roller coaster ring beam around the edge and cantilevered that out. And that allowed us to work on a facade made of timber that echoed the geometry and feel of the track and somehow hopefully capture that dynamism in the outside of the building. And the fact that the envelopes are tightly wrapped around the spectators and the spectators are tightly around the track, hopefully there'll be a logical progression of the two and the building on the outside will be directly related to the track on the inside. And it came out pretty much as we were expecting, which is good. So, what else could we do in thinking about this building? Well, we, we looked at the bicycle and thought, well, you know, how can we compare ourselves to that as architects and engineers? It's a phenomenal thing. This is Victoria Pendleton's track bikes, and a bit weird looking, but um, what an amazing invention. It's got nothing that's not working on it. Every component is absolutely honed down and beautifully designed, and yet totally functional. Could we take that same logic and put it into the engineering and architecture of the building. So every single piece is doing something and there's nothing extraneous at all. So 
we knew from the engineers on a long span structure, double curvature is massively important in terms of reducing weight, and we had to get that double curvature into the, into the roof. And we used a torus, which gave us a sort of regular shape, because the problem with curves is how the heck do you build them. We needed something that was highly insulated, so it had to have a solid deck on the top. You look back at Munich 40 years earlier, 1972, that was the most amazing cable net structure for the Olympics by Priotto, but it didn't have, you just had perspex on the top of it. You couldn't actually put a solid roof on it. So we needed some degree of order. And we worked very, very hard on looking at the steel, looking at lots of different options. And we took out about 60% of the weight from some very early options through to the final one. And it was mainly due to the using cable net that we were able to achieve that. And we worked with Pfeiffer, the cable net suppliers in Germany, and the whole roof was held up with cables of 36 millimeters, about an inch and a half diameter, in pairs. And they were strung like strings on a tennis racket around that surface. And there you see the double curvature, one side pulling against the other, so in the wind it doesn't flutter. <coughs> and the way that worked was they um, put the pairs of cables down, uh, laid them out over the concrete. All the seats and heavy stuff had to be in because you couldn't crane it afterwards fixed the nodes in position, and then put ropes on the end and started to pull them up onto the, onto the ring beam. When they got closer, they used hydraulics. And it was a kind of um, interesting uh, moment, because the Germans were working to plus or minus two millimeters guaranteed, and the Brits were working to plus or minus two inches, possibly. And the British, <laughs> <laughs> and the British guys had made this thing around the outside and never even dared to measure it. And the German cables, they were so confident they'd be the right length, they didn't even have any adjustment on them. So that guy's probably straining like mad to stretch a German cable into a British ring beam. <laughs> and we were terrified. We thought someone would just go ping because there was, you know, anyway. Um, but it was, it was a fantastic piece of construction because we, had, we did the whole roof without a single piece of scaffolding. No one was, um, you know, climbing up and working at heights other than these Germans. Um, who was strapped on and very, very brilliant at climbing. And it all went up incredibly quickly. And I have a little movie, if it works, that shows it going up. It's quite funny, because the guy running the site absolutely hated all the project managers in the press. And they were all dying to come and see this cable net go up. But he got the guys to come really early in the morning and started it at 7. And by 10 o'clock, it had gone up. So this is just over a couple of hours. This thing just pulled into place. Absolutely amazing technology, and it's all, all the points were hydraulically linked together, all the tensions and stresses were calculated, and it was just automatically pulled up and poked into place. There was a safety net underneath, which was in place, so when they put the panels on later, that would serve as the, as the safety net, you could just walk across the panels on the top. And so they tensioned it up, um, the final tensioning took longer than that, to get it in place took you know, a day, and then it took about 10 days to absolutely to uh, make sure all those cables were absolutely right. So that was the shape of the double curvature. And our challenge then was how on earth do you put something solid on top of that? Um, we were working with very lightweight plywood panels um, that sat on nodes that were at the intersection of the cables. And the challenge, as you might imagine, was dealing with the movement between the panels. And so we came up with a system at the bottom where one corner would be fixed, one would slide, and the other two would move either way. Quite complicated. But very simple technology to realize it. These clamped onto the cables. And then we worked out a series of panels um, and batched them in terms of size. This shows how the whole thing fitted together. And um, we managed to make the, the panels in a factory, bring them to site on a lorry, just lift them off and drop them onto those nodes. And they just had four bolts on the corner. It took a couple of minutes to do each one. They were the guys standing on the panels and they just worked their way across. So it's very quick. And then the final roof inside is, is you get what you see. It's the cables the little um, nodes, and then the bare plywood on the underside. Very simple. On top of that, they then put insulation and a standing seed metal roof. But that did work very well. But we knew that the junction between the walls and the roof was going to be very tricky, um, and the subcontractors helped us out there. Um, fantastic <coughs> ability now to cut bits of very standard materials like plywood or glass using CNC machines. And they did these faceted drawings which showed how it all fit together. A bit like building a balsa wood aircraft, built little prototypes and had a kind of device for locking that geometry in. And then made these individual elements which just fastened the ground and clipped them onto the outside of the top of the ring beam. 
And then when the roof went on, that was capped. And interestingly, every single aspect of the building, other than the track and the ring beam, was faceted. But there you see the sharpness of that edge, which is very important in the in visuals of getting the building right. So <coughs> important to bring the subcontractors along to get good results. We designed all the panelling to be prefabricated and go on, but the contractor elected to nail them on, rather than the Sistine Chapel ceiling. These guys were working, leaning on their backs for about two months, nailing every single piece of wood on. But the end effect was fantastic, with all those Western Red Cedar nails, uh, boards um, nailed on. So how did it measure up in terms of performance? We took a quick look at the comparative blue steel weights. The velodrome was 30 kilograms, Beijing was 85, Sydney was 55, Athens with Calatrava's stunkingly big arch was 250, so we did well in terms of steel weights. In terms of embodied carbon, we looked quickly back to the bird's nest, the aquatics, the main stadium in London, and the velodrome. And we can't read those, but the um, bird's nest was 9.3 tons per square meter, aquatics was 2.8. The main stadium was 1.9 and the velodrome was 0.4. So in terms of, sort of performance, even though it's a small building, and therefore <coughs> the ratios are not in our favour, came out very favourably in terms of the amount of uh, carbon. The, the bird's nest is interesting because they put photovoltaics on the roof and claimed it was sustainable. We did a calculation to show that to go from that amount of carbon in that building to the Sydney would take 2,000 years of solar radiation on the PV panels to pay back the indulgence of that building, even though it looks great. Um, the, other, the other kind of philosophical idea we sold at the interview was this notion that the Olympic Games are just a two-week festival of sport, and really you shouldn't be building buildings for that. You should think of the Games as a housewarming party and design the building for afterwards and convert it for the Games. And we, we did stick very strongly to that mentality. So. The building was designed for afterwards and they brought in extra toilets and things just for the games because they will never repeat that. And occasionally the sun comes out in London and we knew we could harness a little bit of that energy occasionally. That's what the rest of London looks like outside the Olympic Park incidentally. You didn't get to see that on television. And so we did a lot of work with Klaus Boda on um, daylight inside, had a series of roof lights, and we were striving to get very uniform light levels inside so you could train in the building without the lights on. Um, and they were, by using interlayers on the glass, we got very uniform light levels inside, so you can cycle in there when it's sunny or, or overcast without the lights on for training purposes. So, um, we had the games, it was fantastic. Um, we got 10 world records, I think, and 24 Olympic records. But the, um, the IOC, in their wisdom, decided to block out all the daylight going into the building. And you see the ring of glass there, has actually got white plastic around it. And they put black plastic over the roof lights because there's some rule in the IOC handbook that says all venues must be completely blacked out. And that was an instance where we said, we'll design it for afterwards and put roof lights in, and they can come along and work them out. And we got some progressing appraise from the Australians who are actually letting daylight in. This was the World Cup event before with the daylight coming in by comparison. So if you look at velodromes, um, in 1948, the Games were also in London, um, on the track on the top left, and we looked at all the velodromes up to Beijing, and noted that all of those ones were um, now out of action. So 50% pretty much were no longer running, and that's because cycling just doesn't pay. And in fact, if you look what's happened to them now, they're either derelict or have been turned into biospheres or supermarkets, or homes for football clubs. And I love this picture because London claims to be the most sustainable games ever, but it probably was in 1948. This is 20,000 people went to watch the cycling at Herne Hill in South East London. This track's still there. In fact, we're doing a little project for it. Uh, and they probably walked there or cycled there. And there's a guy called Tommy Godwin who just passed away recently who won a bronze medal for Britain. He rode an event there and then rode back home to Birmingham, which is about 200 miles away. Which is quite <laughs> I think. Sustainability is relative, isn't it? So our other, our other big thing was, you know, what happens to this building afterwards? How do we stop it just being a white elephant? And this sketch really was about it linking very much to everything round about and becoming a hub for cycling. We had some money in our brief to make it into a cycle centre afterwards, even though space was very tight. And this thing about bringing the, um, the seats in and having this split with the concourse allowed us to get a ring of glass around the building 
and allow the park to go up to that ring of glass. And this meant, there you see the ring of glass, anybody could be in the park, walk up to that glass and look into the building in the future. Conversely, you could be inside and look out on all these other forms of cycling going on round about. So it was very much about inspiring a new generation of kids in the East End of London to get into sport and get into cycling. And this, was the, this is the plan, this is being built up now for a one mile road circuit. Uh, we moved the BMX to be near the velodrome for the games as well, and there's about seven kilometers of mountain biking squeezed onto that site. So, you know, more importantly than being good in the Olympics, hopefully it'll be good for 50, 100 years afterwards in encouraging people to exercise. We worked very closely with George Hargreaves on the landscape. He was doing the landscaping for the park, and we were using his landforms to make good mountain bike circuits. And with an image now of one of the, the BMX riders on the BMX course, which is right behind. So when you stand on that concourse, you'll be watching them, looking into the track riders, looking out to the road cyclists. So it should be very exciting. This was just an animation we've done about what the building will look like in that park afterwards. The housing should arrive. This is a very busy road that flanks the Olympic site. We are right at the north end of the site. Okay. So the games were over. Um, pretty much judged to be successful um, for Britain in terms of our appearance around the world. It cost nine billion pounds, which I worked out is less than one month of the National Health Service cost, so not necessarily that much. Our building cost £65 million, pounds, which was you know, under 1% of the overall budget, so I'm not quite sure what the other 99% went on. Um, we were very pleased with it. Um, the government has made, um, you know, used it to promote itself around the world about green architecture. But I guess the, um, even more importantly for the politicians, so that they can share this image, which is Britain beating both France and Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and that would easily justify nine billion pounds or more. <laughs> so we were, we were kind of thinking, well, that's a bit of a one-off, isn't it? What do you do after that? So we, we devised a sort of modular velodrome, which, working with Ron Webb, um, that could be sold around the world and be, and be sort of broken down into smaller parts. And, and going around in a circle goes back to Michael and the race after the practice. So we... We looked at sort of training venues and smaller venues and made a, a kit of parts with various roof forms that could fit onto this building. So it was quite funny because we, we sent this out to the international federations and we got, a, we got a phone call just before Christmas from these guys in Vietnam who were doing the Asian Games and they said, oh, yeah, we, we want you to do a velodrome, even though we're talking to about three other people as well. And um, we found out a way of making it profitable. What we're going to do is build a 330 metre track, put 20,000 seats around it, We've got a license to do gambling. <laughs> and we said, oh, okay, does that seriously make money then? So they said, they said, no, no, we need it to be on top of a, a multiplex cinema and a hypermarket as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we want some graphics around the outside. So that, amongst other things, is what we're looking at at the minute. Thank you.